Thanks. Thanks. Let me go. Let me go. I'm going to go ahead and get started. Good morning, everybody. I want to welcome everyone to what I expect to be a most informative hearing on how we can accelerate economic growth in the United States. What is holding back economic growth in America has been of central interest to this committee from the onset of my term as chairman. Our, hearing, our hearings have produced useful information and, and insights. I'm particularly pleased to have Chairman Hassett lend his insights today on the forces and constraints that are holding back private investment, labor force participation, and important, just as important as anything else, wages. We hope to get a clearer picture of how the right policies can help the economy recover its full potential. The economy is dealing with the aging of a population, the slowing of a population growth, and technological changes that are altering the methods of production in America. But self-imposed constraints have also altered the way the economy performs, and not in a good way. I strongly believe we can do something about that here in the United States Congress. I'd like to divert your attention to the graph showing how the Congressional Budget Office lowered its assessment of the economy's output potential every year since 2007 through 2016. These are not projections of actual GDP, mind you, but of potential GDP, the economy's output, the economy's output capacity, normally a fairly stable concept. Back in 2007, the CBO estimated the U.S. output potential for 2016 to be over 12 percent higher than it actually is now. What happened? The aging of the population was predictable. Not anticipated was the U.S. business investment would be down from a pre-recession rates and that the rate at which Americans participate in the labor force would be dropping so markedly. Despite the low unemployment rate, the labor market's health has not been fully restored. Indeed, the labor force participation rate of people of prime working age remains substantially below where it was prior to the recession. I believe the economic policy, including the failure to act when other countries were improving their business climate, is largely to blame. I'd like to show you two graphs that illustrate the changes U.S. firms face on the international playing field. The first chart shows how 34 countries changed their corporate tax rate since 2000. All these countries, save Chile, which had the lowest rate initially, reduced their corporate rates to make their economic economies, excuse me, more competitive while the United States rate remained the same. The next chart shows how 27 countries eased product market regulations from 1998 to 2013 based on OCE, OECD index. All these countries, save Chile, reduced their taxes and reduced their regulations. This paints quite a startling picture and explains why, the, why U.S. corporations have been moving offshore. Other countries have purposefully improved their international competitiveness of their business sector, while the United States has taken for granted competitiveness of its businesses. As a result, we now have an economy that does not fully engage its resources and entrepreneurial spirit. A JEC hearing earlier this year on declining economic opportunity revealed a dramatic decline of new business formations in this country since the last recession. From 2008 to 2014, more businesses actually closed then opened. A JEC hearing earlier this month showed how detrimental the tax code can be to starting a new business in terms of both its provisions and its sheer complexity. As the challenges we face are more daunting as a result, the national debt is a bigger problem with, slow, with a slow growing economy. That is why we so urgently need both tax and regulatory reform. We must restore a more highly functioning market economy that offers hope and opportunity to, uh, to investors, to entrepreneurs and workers, and that removes the artificial constraints on a faster economic growth model. Dr. Hassett's ex expertise is well grounded in economic research and one of his areas of specialization is taxation, which is especially useful at, the, at this time. I can't think of a better witness to explain to us just how taxes and regulatory reform can lift the economy and living standards across our country. Chairman Hassett, we appreciate, appreciate your appearance before the committee today. Look forward to hearing your views, and I will now yield to our ranking member, Senator Peters, for his statement today. Thank you, Chairman. And uh, first, I want to thank uh, Chairman Hassett uh, for being uh, with us at the committee today. I'm looking forward to having a substantive uh, discussion on the, the state of the economy and some prescriptions uh, for the future. 
But I also want to thank uh, Chairman uh, Tiberi for, uh, for your presiding over this uh, hearing and uh, also want to wish you well in your future uh, endeavors. Uh, we're sorry to hear the news. Uh, we are certainly going to miss you, uh, you here in Congress, but we also know you're going to enjoy new challenges and most importantly have a little bit more time to acquaint yourself with the family, which is uh, always a wonderful thing. Thank, thank you. you Mr. Chairman, I also think this is a uh, very timely hearing given the uh, ongoing push by the majority and the White House uh, to enact uh, tax legislation on an aggressive timeline. But before we get into specifics of tax policy, I'd like to take a step back and, and take a broader look at the current state of our economy and the economic outlook for the coming years uh, as well as the coming decades. The administration has certainly not shied away from highlighting some positive economic statistics. So unemployment remains low and the stock market uh, continues uh, to climb. But I think we all know that there's more to an economy than just raw monthly job numbers or the daily Dow Jones average. For working Michigan families, uh, we are still seeing persistent, frustrating stagnation on wages. Americans are overwhelmingly still not seeing the growth in wages that normally accompany economic recoveries. Not only do stagnant wages have an immediate negative impact on the day-to-day -day lives of American families, it is also contributing to a, another troubling economic trend, and that's a growing retirement savings crisis. Far too many Americans simply don't have the resources for a secure retirement, and as Americans are living longer with less secure assets for retirement, like uh, defined benefit plans, I believe this will have a serious consequence for our, our entire economy. When it comes to middle-class American families, uh, the state of the economy is mixed. And for policymakers, I believe there are other trends that we must address to ensure health and competitiveness for the American economy in the decades to come and see the type of growth necessary. First, I believe it is of the utmost importance that Congress reject the idea that deferring or, for some, eliminating investment in basic science and research has no consequences. It does. It has significant negative consequences. A lack of commitment to funding research that will lead to the next generation um, great American breakthroughs uh, will have a devastating impact on our economy. And I can promise you our competitors, uh, including China, uh, will not simply stand still and cede the competitive advantage uh, in innovation. Second, well, we, we must reserve, uh, reverse an alarming trend of declining new business formation. New businesses are the driver of our economy and are responsible for most new job creation in the United States. But alarmingly, we are not seeing the numbers of new businesses needed to increase the shared prosperity across the economic spectrum, and especially in the urban-rural divide. New business formations across the presidential administrations in both parties has fallen by half since the late 1970s, and when new businesses are created, they're increasingly concentrated in just a few metropolitan areas like Los Angeles and New York. And finally, I believe perhaps the critical question policymakers must be asking about the future of the economy is how are we going to prepare our workforce for an increasingly autonomous world driven by advances in artificial intelligence uh, and machine learning? This is why we are facing together, I think as a nation, some stagnant wages, a massive retirement savings gap, a retreat from investment in innovation, decreasing business formation except for a few major metropolitan areas, and fundamental shift towards automation that could dwarf the industrial revolution in global impact. These are problems we can work uh, together to solve on a bipartisan basis, and I think we must do this on a bipartisan basis. Unfortunately, I'm concerned that we are going to be spending the coming weeks and months debating just how big a corporate tax cut to multinational conglomerates should receive, and other policies that clearly benefit the very few uh, and most wealthy individuals while raising taxes for middle-class Americans. Despite our differences, I look forward to a serious conversation today and hope that we can find common ground on how to meaningfully support American workers and their families. So thank you, Chairman Hassett, for being here today. Thank you, Mr. Peters. Uh, Senator Peters, thank you for your kind words as well. We are now turning to our distinguished guest, Dr. Kevin Hassett. Dr. Hassett, welcome. Uh, I apologize that we have a Ways and Means Republican meeting going on on tax reform upstairs. So a few other members are up there, and I'll be departing uh, before the hearing is over, unfortunately, to join them. But we are so excited to have you today. The Senate also has a vote, I think, at 1030. 
So sorry for that interruption as well. But let me introduce Dr. Hassett. He's the chairman of the President's Council of Economic Advisors. Prior to this, he worked as a scholar with the American Enterprise Institute. He's also served as an economic advisor to George W. Bush, John McCain, and Mitt Romney presidential campaigns. Dr. Hassett was also a senior economist with the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve and an associate professor at Columbia University. He earned his doctorate in economics from the University of Pennsylvania. Chairman Hassett, it is an honor to have you today. You are now recognized for your testimony. Thank, thank you, Chairman T. Berry, and what an honor it is to be back before the committee uh, with the, the word honorable before my name, which seems really inappropriate, but uh, gosh, I'm so thankful for the support of Senator Lee and Senator Peters and my confirmation in the Senate, and it's great to be back before Mrs. Maloney and Mr. Delaney. Uh, you know, I think the Joint Economic Committee has a proud tradition of focusing on the problems facing America and the solutions that we can agree to on a bipartisan basis, and it's in that spirit that I appear before you today. Uh, in, in the testimony that follows, I'll provide an overview and discuss the status of a number of sectors. I'll emphasize some areas that need attention as well as recommended policy changes that will improve our citizens' economic well-being. If you read the 46 Employment Act that created the Council of Economic Advisors, that's my somber responsibility, is to analyze the economy, to see what's going on, and to provide the President and Congress with objective advice about what we ought to do about it when we're falling short. The economy is buoyed by heightened expectations right now, and it's growing at a solid and sustainable pace with low unemployment and low inflation. Financial markets appear to recognize the likelihood of continued growth with low inflation, with the major stock price indices up substantially over the past year, and with expected inflation from the market for Treasury inflation-protected securities remaining pretty low. That said, the Trump administration is not satisfied with business as usual, nor with the pace of real output and income growth during the past several years. As a result, we've put forward a program designed to boost the rate of real GDP growth. Now, I'm happy to report that the economy is doing well so far in 2017. Real GDP growth during the first two quarters of the year averaged 2.1 percent at an annual rate. Real consumer spending grew 2.6 percent, only slightly below the 2.9 percent rate of growth during the preceding two years. But business investment grew at a 7 percent annual rate during the first half of 2017. And that's a notable acceleration from an essentially flat pace during the preceding two years. But that's very important because after translating this pattern of investment into the flow of capital services, it's apparent that capital deepening, the flow of capital services per hour worked, has made essentially no contribution to the growth of labor productivity in recent years, in contrast to a post-World War II average of 0.8 percentage point per year. Indeed, if you look at the contribution to productivity growth of capital deepening, over the last two years, it became negative for the first time since the Second World War. As I'll discuss in a moment, this administration thinks that tax policy could play a role in reviving the contribution of capital services to labor productivity growth and, most importantly, through that channel to the growth of real wages. But before I do that, let's look at a few other sectors. Real residential investment grew at a slow 1.5% annual rate in the first half of 2017. The low and steady rate of core inflation is notable. Core CPI inflation, excluding food and energy prices, was only 1.7 percent for the 12 months through September. Looking back at the past few years, it appears that real potential GDP appears to be growing at about only a 2 percent annual rate, or perhaps even less, as Chairman T. Berry's chart indicated. And real wage growth in America has stagnated. Over the past eight years, the real median household income in the United States rose by an average of only six-tenths of a percent per year. The relationship between corporate profits and worker compensation broke down really in the late 1980s, before any of the recent policy had a chance uh, to interrupt that. And that deteriorating relationship between the wages of American workers and U.S. corporate profits reflects the state of international tax competition more than anything else, I believe. Countries around the world, as Chairman T. Berry's chart indicated, uh, have responded to the international outflow of capital by cutting their corporate tax rates to attract capital back. Now, a key feature of the joint proposal for taxes of this administration, together with congressional leadership, is the proposed reduction of the statutory federal corporate tax rate from 35 to 20 percent. This conclusion, that the incidence of the corporate tax falls partly but importantly on workers, is driven by empirical patterns that are highly visible, in addition to extensive peer-reviewed research, not to mention a number of follow-up studies to ours that have appeared during the past 10 days or so. For example, the co-variation between real wage growth and statutory corporate tax rates between the most taxed and least taxed countries over recent years, visible in figure one, which might go up over there, uh, is indicative of this larger literature. Of course, simple time series correlations don't tell the whole story, 
but there's a big literature that shows that high corporate tax countries have low wage growth, low corporate tax countries have high wage growth. Between, indeed, between 2012 and 2016, the 10 lowest corporate tax countries of the OECD had corporate tax rates 13.9 percentage points lower than the 10 highest countries. And that's about the same scale as the reduction currently under consideration here in the United States. The average real wage growth in the low tax countries has been dramatically higher, as would have been predicted by the academic literature. Now, the US economy has made great progress during the past years in reducing the jobless rate, but the rate of productivity growth and therefore real wage growth has been slow. It's time for all of us in a bipartisan way to turn our attention to building a plan for boosting the rate of growth in the long run and wage growth in particular. As I've discussed, the administration's plan for tax reform will have an important role in improving the rate of productivity growth in combination with its plan to stabilize the regulatory environment. And we look forward to working with you, the members of this committee, uh, to help reach those goals. I'll be happy now to respond to any questions you have. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hassett. Uh, as I mentioned in my testimony and showed in that graph, over the past decade, the CBO has continually downgraded its estimate of what the economy is capable of producing, our output potential. Is it possible, in your opinion, that the Obama-era policies of higher taxes and heavier regulation actually constrained our economic potential, and, and how could we change that? I think on the regulation, it's certainly possible. I think that your chart really captured what happened uh, in recent years, which is that it's not our actions on tax policy that necessarily harmed us, it's our inactions. And so what happened is the rest of the world cut their corporate taxes, and that made their countries much more attractive for the location of multinational plants than our country. And we saw the activity move overseas uh, in response to that. You know, one metric, Chairman T. Berry, to think about how big this uh, effect is, that there's a National Bureau of Economic Research paper uh, that came out in the spring uh, that looked at just U.S. multinationals. They transfer price their profits abroad to the foreign plants, uh, but they transfer price the profits abroad by paying too much for the products that they buy from, say, the Irish plant. And this, this uh, study estimated that 52% of our trade deficit right now is coming about because of this transfer pricing. We're paying too much for stuff from our foreign subs. We're moving that much activity offshore, so much activity that 52% of our trade deficit is attributable to it. And so, of course, that means lower demand for workers and, and lower wages as well. Thank you. You have written and spoken in recent years on the challenges of the uneven economic recovery. Uh, a topic we've explored in this committee, a topic that Senator Peters mentioned uh, as well. Indeed, a wide, array of research, a wide array of research makes clear that this recovery has been the most geographically concentrated on record, leaving far too many communities like in Ohio and Michigan, uh, for example, uh, behind communities and the people who live in those communities behind. As you know, I've introduced legislation to provide a new market-driven way of getting private capital off the sidelines and into our communities struggling to foster new business and create jobs called the Investing in Opportunity Act, which has garnered broad bipartisan support and bicameral support as Senator Tim Scott is the lead sponsor in the Senate. Two questions for you. First, can you briefly describe the dimensions and consequences of this trend that's occurring within our economy of increasingly concentrated job growth in, in, in places like Los Angeles and, and New York? And secondly, can you speak to the administration's commitment to ensuring tax reform ensures the challenge head on of incorporating ideas like the Investing in Opportunity Act? Yeah, thank you, Chairman Timmery. Uh, the, uh, Geographic inequality has been a focus of my academic work for many years, and it's really the reason why I'm an economist. I mentioned in my confirmation hearing that I grew up in a town, Greenfield, Massachusetts, where the Greenfield Tap and Die, which was the main factory in town, closed. And across the way in Turters Falls, there was a big paper mill that was the main employer there, and that closed too. Uh, my dad and I, when I go home, my dad still lives in Greenfield, walk next to the abandoned factories because they're right along the Connecticut River. It's a beautiful walk, but the factories are so torn, you know, falling apart that uh, the video game Fallout used it as, as a location uh, for video shooting for post-apocalyptic America. And, and so this is something that I care desperately about, and that's why my academic career has really focused a lot on geographic inequality, including, as you mentioned, in states like Ohio and, and Michigan, where they're distressed communities where the plants closed and the, nothing, you know, the jobs have, haven't come back. 
Uh, I think that tax reform in general will definitely encourage a lot of plant location back into the U.S. because uh, right now, again, if you locate in Ireland, you're paying almost no tax. If you locate in the U.S., you're paying the highest tax in the developed world. Uh, but we also should pay close attention to where those plants are going to go. And as you said, that if the plants were to all locate in the places like that, are, that have very low unemployment rates right now, then they won't necessarily be helping those distressed communities. Now, the administration doesn't have an official position yet. It's not something I've discussed with the president on your specific proposal. But I can tell you that the geographic inequality is something that, that everybody's paying very close attention to. Senator Peters, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Hassett, um, you have uh, certainly been engaged in a, in a pretty high-profile debate of sorts over the, uh, the impact of the administration's tax proposal and what it will have uh, on uh, wages uh, for working Americans. And, and I think there's uh, certainly an awful lot, of, uh, a lot to dive into regarding uh, that argument. Uh, but to be brief, I'm somewhat skeptical of uh, the numbers that you have put out. Uh, and I think I'm in pretty good company. And the fact that I think a majority of economists also have, are very skeptical of some of the numbers that we have heard from the administration. And certainly I believe that many uh, working families uh, back home in Michigan uh, are also very skeptical about that. Uh, for them, uh, I don't think many uh, Michiganders are, are holding their breath to see if uh, their boss's boss's boss tax cut uh, somehow trickles down to them uh, to see uh, either in uh, increased growth or in wage increase. Instead, they want to know how this tax proposal is going to impact them, how it's going to impact their pocketbook. Uh, they certainly have to worry about everyday challenges like every family, about buying a car and paying for daycare and providing for a secure retirement. So I think we need the administration to be a little bit more direct as to the consequences of the tax plan that is before us, specifically as it is uh, tailored to individ individuals so folks know exactly what this means uh, for them. Uh, certainly some estimates uh, that I have seen have shown that some middle class families uh, could see an $800 increase uh, in this tax plan, because it is focused primarily at uh, the folks at the very top of the uh, income scale and large corporations, and they'll actually be paying for it in the form of higher uh, taxes. So I think we need to make sure the American public and families know what that is. And given the fact that the median income for families in Michigan is a little over $52,000, uh, an $800 tax increase is a big deal for, uh, for those families, and we need to have full disclosure in this plan going forward. So uh, I understand you may find some disagreement with some of these uh, estimates that, that are being put out by various economists and other types of think tanks, but could you give this committee today an, an estimate of the tax savings that a working family will get as a result of the tax plan that has been proposed? Yes, thank you, Senator. Um, you know, I know that there, first to the first part of your question and then uh, go to the tax savings uh, discussion that uh, so sorry to interrupt, uh, Mr. Hassett, could you move a little closer oh, to sorry. the mic? Uh, yeah. uh, thank you for, um, thank you. Yes. Um, I, you know, I think that, that let's talk about what we agree about. Uh, in the CEA report that we just put out, we found that there's been a, a disconnect between the welfare of corporations and the welfare of workers, that corporate profits are soaring, but wages are not. And that's very unusual in U.S. history. I think we agree that that disconnect has happened. I think we also agree that we're the highest corporate tax place in the developed world. Uh, that, that's a, a simple fact. Uh, and so then uh, the other thing that I think we agree about, because it's, it's a fact, is that uh, their capital deepening contribution to productivity growth in the U.S. has gone to the lowest level it's been since World War II. And so I think that it behooves all of us, it's our really somber responsibility to think about what is driving these factors. I think that the best explanation uh, for those patterns in the data is that the corporate rates around the world have gone down a lot. They've encouraged U.S. multinationals to locate plants there instead of here, uh, and that's why we see everything that we do. Uh, I know that if uh, labor demand goes up in the U.S., that wages will go up and that there's a dispute about how much, but I don't think that there's anyone that thinks that it's zero. Now, as for the estimate of the tax effect, uh, as you know, that the administration is committed to a process that you know, hopefully can be bipartisan, where uh, you know, the committees are working out where the brackets go, and, and the president has even mentioned that we're open to a higher top rate if that's what it takes to get broad support for this tax plan. And I think that this process is designed optimally to create a bipartisan agreement about tax reform, and it's certainly everyone's hope 
that, that we had there. Uh, and you know, so, so if I were to say, well, this family is gonna get this tax cut, then I would step in front of that process because where the brackets are located is being negotiated in the Ways and Means Committee upstairs uh, and in the Finance Committee right at this moment. Well, but you're going to be a very important part of that process. You're the principal advisor to the administration uh, as to where this policy should be and how it's going to impact growth. And so, uh, so I'm going to want to, I want to pursue that just a, a, a little bit. But before I say that, uh, you t we, we do agree on the disconnect between corporate profits uh, and, and wage levels for most workers uh, in those companies. In fact, corporate profits are at an all-time high, so it's not that corporations are hurting right now. Uh, but we have seen certain individuals have benefited, and uh, certainly, first and foremost, we know CEOs at those uh, corporations have done very well. In fact, I think CEO pay uh, has grown about 90 times faster than the typical worker uh, since 1978. So the folks at the very top are reaping all of the rewards of that growth. It is not impacting everyday Americans. And we have a tax code now, or a tax proposal that's going to say those folks who are reaping all those benefits, they need to pay less taxes. I don't think the average worker thinks that's the case. They think they need that kind of relief. And so as we are talking about the, the particulars of uh, an individual family, uh, I want to know, and we've heard President Trump say that middle class families will not see a tax increase. Is that the position of the administration? And yes. will you use that uh, influence that you have with uh, the president and the president stand by those comments to the Ways and Means Committee here that's saying middle income taxpayers? All middle-income taxpayers will not see a tax increase? The, the, the president is adamant on that point, that it's the one thing for him that's non-negotiable, that there is not going to be a middle-class tax hike in this tax bill. And as for the corporate profit point, I know we're running a little late, but this is very important, and I, I would hope that I, I could uh, respond to that too, uh, because it's a very important point, that right now, U.S. multinational profits are, as you said, at an all-time high. Uh, and executive compensation is skyrocketing. Uh, the last I checked, I could follow up on this, that, that executive compensation in the U.S. was higher than dividends. Go, go figure. Uh, and, and, but, what, but the disconnect from wages is not because there's been a fundamental change in market power here in the U.S. The disconnect in wages occurs because the profits aren't in the U.S. The profits are over there. And so right now we have the highest tax uh, on earth, but those companies aren't paying it because they're locating the, the revenue in, in Ireland. And so uh, it, if we make our country more attractive for location of plants, then it's not that we're giving a big tax cut to companies that are already not paying. It's just that they're not paying the tax because they're locating the activity over there, and the profits that are sky high in the U.S. are driving up wages in places like Ireland. Well, and if I may, uh, uh, George, just briefly, because I, I want to make sure I'm clear about taxes for middle-income families, because mm -hmm. some of the, the numbers that I have seen uh, particularly with the elimination, for example, of state and local deductions for state and local taxes. Uh, there have been a number of studies that show that, that uh, with that deduction elimination, a lot of middle class families are going to see an increase. About 12 or 26 percent of families in Michigan claim that state and local deduction, and it's all over the country. Uh, and some studies have said the average increase for folks could be up to $1,800 a year because of the loss of that deduction. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, you'll see a number of those figures. So uh, given what you said, I hope you will understand when those of us are pushing back on a proposal that may be put before us that's going to raise that, we're going to say we can't support that. And we're going to hope we'll be aligned with the president that we can't support these increases on middle class families and we'll push back pretty aggressively on the Republican that, proposal. That's understandable. And, and, and when the complete plan is available, you know, I look forward to working through those numbers with you and your staff. Right. Thank you. Dr. Halsett, uh, we're grateful to have you here, and congratulations on your confirmation. Um, uh, look forward to working closely with you uh, in your new role over at CEA. We are in the middle of a significant debate, a, a debate that's been made clear even so far this morning in our discussion. I want to pick up on something that Senator Peters was discussing, because I think it's an important point, uh, having to do with our corporate tax rate. At 35%, we have the highest corporate tax rate in the developed world. And uh, there are problems with that, uh, problems that I think are acknowledged by most uh, Republicans and most Democrats. But sometimes I, I don't think we look into it quite enough. Sometimes we tend to look at the corporate tax as being something that is paid, a burden that is borne solely by uh, wealthy corporate fat cats, the likes of whom could be depicted with a Monopoly game piece or depicted sort of like Mr. Peanut with a monocle and a double-breasted suit. But when you take a really close look at, at who exactly pays corporate taxes, the, the picture is a little bit different. 
uh, it, it taxes effectively both capital and labor, both the investors' dividends and the wages of the workers. Economists disagree a little bit on how this breaks down, but it's commonly understood that lost worker wages make up between one quarter and one half of corporate tax revenue. Some actually put the figure higher than that. And so uh, 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 perhaps a quarter to a half, maybe more, uh, borne by workers. On top of that, you've got everything that people buy, every good, every service in the economy is made more expensive uh, by a tax like that. And um, there's also uh, diminished wages, uh, unemployment, and underemployment that, that can sometimes stem from that. So in the end, I tend to view this 35% corporate tax as having some very nasty regressive effects, meaning that its least desirable qualities in, include the fact that it is borne disproportionately uh, by America's poor and middle class. This is why in January I, I penned an op-ed in The Federalist that proposed eliminating the corporate tax altogether and shifting that particular tax burden uh, onto investors instead of workers by, by taxing capital gains and dividends at ordinary income rates instead of having the corporate tax. Under this type of strategy, workers could be liberated from their share of the corporate tax burden. And America would, without a doubt, become the most popular place in the world to do business. So, Dr. Hassett, I'd, I'd love to get your comments, your, any thoughts you might have on that idea. Well, uh, thank, thank you, uh, Vice Chairman Lee. I, I think that, again, uh, wage growth is low, profit growth is high, the profits are over there, uh, we've got the highest rate, and we see that countries around the world that are run by governments that, you know, that don't have the commitment to the American system that every member of you know, both parties uh, here in Congress has uh, cutting their corporate rates. Uh, President Macron uh, ran in France on reducing the corporate rate to 25%, and the French rate was already below ours as that election began. Uh, Syriza, the Greek government who uh, translates their party uh, title into the coalition of the far left, they have a lower corporate tax rate than us. Uh, this is not about uh, right-wing parties throwing money at rich corporations. It's about economically literate governments understanding that if we want wages to be higher, then we have to give workers capital uh, to work with. And that if you look at the U.S. right now, again, the contribution to productivity growth from capital deepening is lower than it's been since the Second World War. We've got a crisis in our country, and it's something that everybody on this committee needs to work together to solve. And, and this idea of zeroing out the corporate tax altogether and replacing it with a, a, a tax on dividends and capital gains that would put it on par with uh, the taxes we impose on income, what do you think of that idea specifically? The, the, you know, I'm focused uh, like a laser right now as an advisor to the president on the proposals that, that are there. Uh, uh, your uh, idea is something that's you know, quite analogous to something that a lot of other countries have done. Uh, a few countries ha have uh, eliminated it altogether, but, but many have integrated the corporate tax with the dividend and the capital gains uh, tax so that they're, they're basically charging tax once at, at one level, but in a progressive manner. If you throw it at the individual side, then if there's like a retiree who's getting a dividend uh, then, and, and they're using that dividend to pay their utility bill, then maybe you don't want to tax the heck out of that dividend. But if there's a really rich person getting a dividend, maybe you do. And those are the kind of arguments that have motivated other countries to do that. But, but for me right now, I'm focused on the current proposal. There's another issue that's closely related to this one, and it deals with the burden of overregulation. I, I keep two stacks of documents in my office here in Washington. Uh, one stack is a few inches tall. It's a few thousand pages long. I think for last year it was 3,000 pages long. It's a, the laws passed by Congress last year. The other stack is 13 feet tall. For last year it was about 96,000 pages long. And it's last year's Federal Register, the annual cumulative indexes of, of, of federal regulations as they're released and later finalized. Those regulations end up costing the American economy about $2 trillion a year. This is up from just $300 billion a year 20 years ago when I first started tracking this problem. So it's increased roughly sevenfold. It's the product, really, of congressional delegation of power. Congress not wanting to make law itself and stand accountable for the difficult line-drawing decisions that go along with setting public policy and having someone else do it. 
And yet, it's costing the economy $2 trillion a year, and I believe those effects are borne disproportionately by America's poor and middle class. In, in your opinion, do you, do you think an idea like the, the regulatory budgeting idea I've proposed or the RAINS Act, which would require congressional approval of major regulations, uh, would have a desirable impact on GDP and uh, uh, benefits for America's poor and middle class? Uh, yeah, thank you, Senator. Uh, in terms of the specific proposals, I would have to touch base with my colleagues at the White House. It's not something I've discussed with them, and I wouldn't, you know, wish to signal an official White House position that, I, that I'm not currently informed about. But certainly the topics that you mention are incredibly important to the White House. And, and I think that one reason why sentiment in the U.S. is so much higher right now is that there's been a lot of palpable deregulation so far uh, this year, but also uh, uh, almost a halt of, of costly new regulations. And one of the things that uh, we at CEA have been studying is sort of the impact on firms of new regulations. And, and it's really quite striking because if all of a sudden you run a business and that the U.S. government has a new regulation, then you have to figure out what to do. You've got to hire lawyers. You've got to decide whether you've got to put new things into your plant. Uh, and it's a real urgent problem. The regulation from three years ago uh, has costs too because it's distorted your previous behavior. But the new regulations are incredibly costly. And uh, one think tank in town has estimated that because we've just slowed new regulations, that we've reduced the amount of man hours spent complying with new regulations this year by more than six million uh, man hours. And I think that, that that gives you an idea of the kind of effect of prudent uh, regulatory reform. But we're also very mindful, just as a, a final thing, that, that how important many regulations are, like clean air and clean water and so on. And so we're not talking about wiping away all regulations, but just exposing the ones that exist and the new ones that we might think of to really careful cost-benefit analysis. Uh, th thank you very much, Mr. Asset. I see my time's expired. Mr. Delaney. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Thank you, uh, Dr. Hassett, and congratulations uh, you. on your appointment. You bring tremendous expertise and very good judgment uh, to this important job, so it's great to have you in the seat. Just staying on the corporate tax question for a moment, um, it seems to me that across the last decade or two, a very large percentage of businesses, particularly large businesses, have moved from an incorporated status to a pass-through status. Mm -hmm. Uh, largely because of how the private equity industry has grown, and in every kind of private equity-backed transaction, those companies move to an LLC status where they don't pay any corporate tax, and in fact, many of them pay very little tax because they're leveraged and they can deduct the interest. And there's no evidence or data that I've seen to indicate that wages have grown any faster in those companies where there's no corporate tax than in incorporated uh, businesses in this country. So does that to some extent... Um, mitigate this argument that the corporate tax rate is the reason that that uh, wages haven't grown in this country because in fact a a growing and large percentage of the businesses in this country in fact don't pay tax because of what i just discussed and their wages have not grown any faster based on any analysis that's been done than wages in c corporations which actually pay this tax uh, uh Thank, thank you for the question, Mr. Delaney. As always, it's a very interesting one, and uh, I'm not sure there's a literature on that question yet, but if there is, I'll find it and, and, and send you a note about it, and, and it's a really great question, so I'll have to speculate about if that effect is, is there, uh, which I, I won't dispute or, or concede because I'd have to study the numbers a little sure. bit more, uh, why that might be. Don't forget that, that the U.S. labor market is a place where work, you know, firms show up and compete for workers, ideally. Uh, and that it's, it's so that the wage is set by total labor demand in the, in the country. If we have a big chunk of the firms in the country that are locating the jobs overseas, then that reduces overall demand. Right. But in the end, if uh, you know, Hassett Incorporated and, and uh, Comstock Incorporated is competing for Delaney, uh, then we're going to have to pay you about Got the it. same wage. So, and quick point on corporate tax. The average corporate rate is, in fact, about 23 or 24 percent. Is that about right? Uh, the, if, if you mean the taxes divided by total revenues yeah. at the average rate, I think it, the last I checked for multinationals, it was a good deal lower than that. Got it. And is that more consistent with our competitors as opposed to our stated rate, which is the highest? The, the, if the revenue is low uh, with our high tax rate because people locate activity offshore, right. right, that it doesn't mean that we've got a low tax rate. Right. And so I just it means careful you're just about deferring that. It it's not of logic. Yes. So you, I, I loved how you talked about focusing on things we can agree on, because we need to do more of that here. We tend to focus on all the things we don't agree on. But two things that I think that there's broad agreement on, um, and I think you have opinions on these topics. The first is tying infrastructure with tax reform. 
which I've worked on extensively, as I think you know, uh, around international tax reform. And it seems to me it's a missed opportunity not to do infrastructure as part of tax reform because it's really the only way to pay for infrastructure and everyone seems to agree we need more investment in infrastructure. And then the second question is a carbon tax, uh, which would obviously generate an, a, an enormous number of, amount of revenues which could be used for broad-based tax reduction, individuals, small businesses, C-corps, whatever the case may be, under the category of we'd rather maybe tax pollution as opposed to income and profits. Can you comment on, on, on the wisdom of having infrastructure as part of tax reform and perhaps a carbon tax as part of tax reform? Uh, sure. Uh, the first, uh, you know, I'm an economist, and, and uh, if I look back at the times I've worked on presidential campaigns and advised people, then they tended to lose. And so I don't give political advice because uh, uh, it's not very uh, good. More, an more of a matter of smart tax policy. <laughs> but tying stuff, yeah, so infrastructure is really important. Tax reform is really important. Whether they go together is something that, that you folks are, are the experts, are the experts okay. in. Um, and the second question. Carbon tax. Carbon tax. Yeah, I've written extensively about a carbon tax, as you know, which uh, may motivate uh, the question. And, yes. You know, my job as uh, CEA chair is to provide objective analysis of proposals. And if someone were to propose that, then I'm sure when I did that, I'd be citing some of my own work. Which and I what is your about. directional opinion on a carbon tax, whether a carbon tax that would, that whose revenues would be effectively dividended back to the American people, either directly or through other tax cuts, how would that uh, affect economic growth, putting aside you know, what I view as perhaps most important benefit, which was to reduce greenhouse gases, but how would you view that as just it, economists to relate to economic growth? Sure, sure. again, not speaking on administration policy, sure, but I as an economist who does the literature, there's an economist at the Res Resources for the Future at the University of Maryland named uh, Rob Williams, uh, who's done a very careful modeling job of looking at carbon taxes and how they affect the overall economy. And depending on which tax rates you reduce when you pair it with a carbon tax, you can get either really big negative effects on the economy or uh, not so big small positive effects. So you can get positive to negatives if, if you, the devil or, or God is in, in the his details. model. That's that's what it says. Here. Great. Thank you, Dr. Hazard. Sure. Thank you. I guess I'll now recognize myself for uh, <laughs> five minutes and. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hassett. Good to uh, be with you, thank you. Chairman, and uh, welcome you here to this committee and to your new position here. Um, I wanted to follow up a little bit on, sort of on the growth rates, and as we look at growth in, in what we're doing in, in taxes and how that relates to our international competition so in, and the potential or growth in the in economies, like say, you know, when you look at, you know, India and you know the growing middle class there and the potential we have to um, benefit from that, whether it's trade or other, but but also in in the growing competition that we're going to have. What are the best policies that you think in in terms of getting our growth rate up? Because you know, when you go to other countries and here, you know, they're having eight percent or nine percent. I, and when I look at a lot of the potential, I, I'm in Virginia with a lot of technology um, sector in, in my district, and I often hear from them about they're just sort of waiting whether they can invest here or invest somewhere else. Should I go to India? Should I go, you know, some other country, or should I invest here? What policies can we put in place that will then sort of unleash it to both grow here, but then interact with the growing economy around the world? You know, I, I think that uh, there are three components uh, to economic growth. To grow output, you need to grow inputs. And you can have more labor input either because you have more workers or because the workers are more talented. You can have more capital uh, because we're an attractive place for the location of capital. Or, or both of them can get better because of technological change. Now, when you look around the world and you see countries growing at 9 or even 15 or 20 percent, which happens sometimes, then very often that happens because they're starting out from a place where they're not at the technological frontier, so they can copy existing practice and skyrocket in growth because they're just going to doing it, you know, as well as, you know, half as well as, as a major developed country. Uh, the problem for us being, like, really the the class of the world in terms of a technological frontier or very close to it is that the sort of innovation part of growth is a lot harder because we can't just copy what somebody else is doing. We have to actually innovate and discover something that no one ever 
knew uh, existed. Uh, but we could also, there are things that we can correct uh, uh, with policy, and, and we can affect labor supply and capital supply. And I think that the tax reform that has been negotiated with the White House and Congress is designed optimally to help, to help both. On the individual side, by reducing marginal tax rates, it'll encourage higher labor supply. And on the corporate side, uh, by making the U.S. A, a place where plants want to locate again, we should increase capital formation as well. And then are there ways we can, as you know, with the workforce development, and I know that's an issue that we'll be dealing with also, probably subsequent to mm -hmm. tax reform, how can we best invest in our workers and grow? Because with the information economy, with this expanding economy and middle class around the world, our workers, if we're going to continue to lead, need to be the, the most talented, and we need to continually invest. And we always talk about lifelong education. What policies can we then put in place to develop and constantly upgrade our employees so that they their wages are growing, you know, substantially, and we don't have the stagnation that we have now? Well, well, sure. One key factor is uh, human capital formation and educating our workers and helping them keep up with the rapid technological changes in society. And you know there are a number of uh, initiatives that are being studied and enacted now by Secretary DeVos and the rest of the team on, on the education team uh, to help workers keep up. I think that one of the things looking back at our, our policy failures collectively as a nation over the last few years is that we've not necessarily done a good job of that. If you look at the people who've received uh, uh, training because they lost their job because of trade, for example, then that training doesn't always look like it's been that helpful. Uh, and so it's something that we need to study very carefully and improve upon. Maybe in terms of having, you know, look at all these training programs that we have across numerous agencies, kind of consolidating them really having them directed towards maybe the work shortages. I know we have, in Virginia, we have lots of cyber jobs open and you can, we have programs, I'll give a plug for uh, Capital One has done some great uh, outreach with communities where kids aren't necessarily going to college, but they'll get them in and they've uh, gone out and recruited kids in um, lo lower income areas, but with real potential, bring them in for a six month to a year program and they're having huge success getting them into that cyber pipeline. Mm -hmm. And then if they wanna go back to business school, they wanna to go to you know, college, they now have a job where they also will get tuition assistance and things like that. So um, how can, so, so maybe as we're looking at these training programs, but also maybe tax policy, how we can encourage companies to invest in their workers like that and, re, and, and match the, education efforts to the jobs that are open and that we're deficient in filling. That's yeah, certainly an important objective. Okay, great. Thank you, thank you. And I will uh, now yield uh, to my colleague, Mrs. Maloney, for five minutes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, and uh, congratulations on your appointment. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, it's wonderful to have you here today. Now, now, in the words of a famous and immortal New Yorker, Yogi Berra, <laughs> this uh, hearing and topic uh, sounds a great deal like deja vu. This, this country has heard again and again about how huge tax cuts uh, for the most fortunate will pay for themselves and that the benefits will somehow trickle down to benefit working families. And again, again, that has not been the case. Just uh, last April, this committee had a hearing where we debated the virtues of trickle-down economics and featured the inventor of the Laffer Curve, uh, Arthur Laffer, and Dr. Jared Bernstein, who was the chief economist to former Vice President Joe Biden. The Mr. Laffer made a number of the same claims being made here today about the benefits of uh, giant tax cuts. And, and after the hearing, he published a number of articles that pointed out that that is not what happened. And I'd like, uh, and it's not likely to happen again, I would say, based on the past uh, performance. So without objection, I would like to submit copies of these articles into the record. Okay. Now, now, according to your prepared testimony, you estimate that the administration's proposed tax cut to the corporate tax rate would increase uh, the level of average household income in the United States by at least 4,000 annually 
after the effects have taken place. That's on page uh, four of your testimony. Mm -hmm. Correct. Well, I must say that that sounds absolutely wonderful, but it uh, sounds a little bit to me like you can lose all this weight, but you don't have to exercise and you don't have to go on a diet and past performance doesn't show that. Now, the New York Times pointed out in one of their articles that a 2012 Treasury Department study found that less than a fifth of the corporate tax falls on workers. So that's not this trickle down to them. And a congressional research report last month concluded that the effects of corporate taxes fell largely on high income Americans, not, not average workers. So I'd like to, without objection, to place into the record these two s reports also. Without objection? Without Thank you. Now, factcheck.org, you may have seen the report that they did on your numbers. They also took a, a, a look at the underlying math and found that there were roughly 125 uh, million households in the U.S. last year and an average increase of 4,000 for each of these households would equal more than 503 billion annually. But according to the U.S. Treasury, the total amount that U.S. collected in corporate taxes in fiscal year 2017 was just 297 billion. So even if you somehow transferred all the money previously collected in corporate taxes directly, to American households, you'd still be about 200 billion short. And uh, that doesn't add up to me. So to support the administration's proposal, you further uh, testified today, and you give the example in your testimony, that between 2012 and 2016, the 10 lowest corporate tax co uh, countries of the OECD at a corporate tax rate 13.9 percentage points lower than the uh, 10 highest corporate tax countries about the same scale as the reduction currently under consideration in the United States. But you don't list those countries. Mm -hmm. uh, but I assume that they must in include low tax countries like Switzerland and Latvia. And I'd like for the record for you to submit who these countries are. Well, I looked at Latvia, and it's a great country. And they have emerged in a noble fashion from communism and com Soviet oppression. But last year, the GDP of Latvia was 27.68 billion. And that is not quite as good as Vermont. Uh, and Vermont, uh, they came in at number 50 in GDP among our states. So. Are you seriously suggesting that the U.S., a country with huge, complex, dynamic economy and a GDP last year of over $18 trillion, can and should model its tax policy after that of an Eastern European country still emerging from the yoke of communism? Uh, actually, Switzerland also has a very low tax rate with a GDP that is less than that of one of our great states, Vermont. And if I can use Latvia as a model, then we should also use the uh, tragic example, I would say, of Kansas uh, as a cautionary tale, uh, a tale about the economic chaos that happened if your brand of trickle-down economics is put into place. Uh, uh, Kansas is not a, a pretty picture. Uh, so your comment really on, on the 10 compared to the 10 highest, and uh, to me it doesn't make a, a, a normal or accurate comparison, and the numbers that were really um, refuted by factcheck.com on the 4,000 benefit. Uh, one of the items that uh, Mr. Senator Peters mentioned is the concern that many of us have that outside organizations and analysis are saying that 80 percent of the tax cut goes to the most fortunate, uh, which is not the stated uh, claim or purpose or goal of, of the administration. But in its current form, uh, numbers don't lie. And uh, the numbers are coming in in a way that uh, does not uh, uh, benefit the working man and woman in our country. Um, thank, thank you very much. It's, it's uh, 
Uh, always a pleasure to appear uh, before you, Mr. Always Mr. a Lenny. pleasure to see you. And, and, Congratulations. Uh, and so I'll respond to two uh, directly. Uh, the first, the point about Latvia. There is a very large literature that looks at how corporate tax rates change and then how wages respond. And in order to estimate that effect, you need variation in the tax rates. And so there's variation over time within countries. There are studies that look at that. There's variation across countries. Uh, there's variation Excuse me within a second, but when you make a presentation, if you could give us the 10 countries that you're looking at. I will do that. I, I will follow up and send them. I, I can't think of them off the top of my head, in part because it changes each year because yeah. people are cutting their taxes. Uh, but, there, but this evidence has been found in people who look across U.S. states. You mentioned Vermont, and so there's a paper a Federal Reserve paper that, that looks at when states change their corporate taxes, what happens to wages. There's uh, papers that look at Canada, across Canadian provinces, uh, Germany. Uh, and, and so the chart was meant to summarize what is basically a, a result that appears over and over the literature in an easy to digest form. And I think it served that purpose. I think that the factcheck.org uh, point, uh, which has been emphasized also publicly by a few economists, is really something of a, of a classic economic blunder. Uh, the, the fact is that uh, if right now uh, we have a corporate tax system that encourages firms to locate their activity in Ireland in order to avoid U.S. tax, and they do that by creating jobs in Ireland instead of here, then we're barely getting any revenue at all from the corporate tax here because they've moved the money to Ireland. I think we've kind of agreed that U.S. multinationals aren't paying uh, that tax. Uh, and, and so to look at the change in revenue and the change in wages and, and to say that that's a meaningful uh, ratio is something that's been disproven uh, by uh, careful analysis by uh, John Cochran at the University of Chicago, Casey Mulligan at the University mm -hmm. of Chicago, and Greg Mankiw at Harvard University. And so the factcheck.org uh, numbers are just, just not correct. Thank you. Well, uh, if you'd send me the reports that you're, you mentioned, Sure will. And uh, I, I will send you the Treasury Department report in the Congressional Research Service. I've read both of those, and, uh, Congressman. That uh, refute that. So as we go forward in this debate, it's important that we get our numbers straight. And, uh, and I would like to see the numbers that you um, projected uh, with the uh, foreign countries. And uh, this is important. I'd like to see the money brought back to uh, America and invested in our economy and in our infrastructure. I agree with you on that. And this is a work in, in, in progress. Uh, we do need to simplify our tax code, but we certainly need to do it in a way that is fair to working men and women. And I do not believe that the current uh, form that's before us, of course, it's going to be debated and changed as we go forward, as you pointed out, uh, does that. Uh, thank you so much for your service. Thank you. Thank and you. I, I guess I yield to uh, Ms. Senator Lee, right? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Senator Klobuchar. Oh, thank you very much. Um, and thank you so much for being here. And I would share um, the representative's concern about the current proposal. But I want to start out with something. I know that you've done some work uh, in rural economic area. And um, I'm still seeing a lot of challenges. I was just up on the Canadian border with Representative Peterson. Um, we obviously talked about the current estate tax proposal and how it only helps, I think, two people in his district. Uh, but last year, uh, we saw large layoffs on the Iron Range due to steel dumping. Um, people are now just getting back to work. Uh, we have a shortage of workforce housing. So while we have that going on in a lot of our rural areas, we actually have housing issues because we have some successful companies. Um, and uh, we have job openings, but not enough trained workers, and I know you've been asked about this. Uh, you've written about the challenges facing our rural communities. What policies or programs do you think we should implement to help? Um, yeah, thank you, uh, Senator, and thank you for your, uh, for your support in my nomination to my confirmation. I'm very grateful for that and humbled by it. I, I think that uh, the geographic inequality around our country right now is very palpable in many different ways, uh, that there are places that are booming. Um, at the state level, for example, right now, Colorado has about half a unemployed worker per job listing. And if you uh, survey firms, then the biggest number one problem they have is that they can't find the workers for the job openings that they have. And then, as you know, that there are many parts of your state and every state uh, that have exactly the opposite circumstance where the unemployment rate is way north of 10%, has been for more than a decade, uh, and doesn't seem like it's budging even though the economy's doing great. Uh, I think that 
uh, I, as an economist, am hopeful that the uh, corporate tax reform that is currently being considered uh, could do quite a bit to help that. Uh, because with a tight labor market in lots of parts of the country, uh, then uh, if you're a firm and you want to locate a plant here instead of Ireland, then you've got to find a place where there are a lot of workers. Uh, and you're going to, because if you, if you locate there, then you'll actually be able to fill up, fill up the plant. And, and so I think that, that that big picture effect is probably the, the biggest thing that we can do. Uh, earlier, uh, we talked with Chairman Tiberi about a proposal that he's put forward, which the White House has no current position on, about uh, how to address geographic inequality more specifically uh, with a proposal, a bipartisan proposal that Mr. Uh, Tiberi is a co-chair of. But I think that ideas like that, or, or a co-sponsor of, excuse me, ideas like that are things that we need to explore as well. Okay, and you mentioned the tax in other countries locating overseas, and <clears throat> certainly one of the biggest goals here we have is to have jobs in America. And I was just talking before I came over here with some tax experts about the difference as someone that would like to bring the money back from overseas, it's over there, between a global minimum tax idea where you have the average among um, countries um, versus the previous administration had proposed a ter ter territorial tax idea uh, where you would have a minimum tax per country as opposed to having this average. And what would the average do? Could you talk about the difference between those two proposals? I'm not talking about specific rates. I'm talking about the mechanics of how they would work and the effect that could have on companies' incentives to keep jobs in America. I, I know that uh, this issue is something that's currently being studied carefully by the committees. I think that everybody uh, involved that studied it, including uh, President Obama, thinks that we should move towards a territorial system. Uh, the sort of frustrating part uh, for people who do taxes that there really isn't just a territorial system and a worldwide system, but, but there's degrees of territoriality and, and worldwide. A and um, I look forward to seeing uh, what the committees come up with specifically on, on this issue. Uh, and, uh, and I think it's, it's a very important one for understanding the international tax implications of the corporate tax. But, uh, okay. I think we have to let the committees decide where they're going to go on okay, that. Okay, la last question I have is just on the economic uh, opportunities that we could have with immigration reform. Um, and Grover Norquist, when I was the uh, ranking on this committee, came in and gave a full throated, uh, his full throated support for uh, immigration comprehensive reform with the basis that we could bring down the debt. And there's been many studies, CBO studies on that, and also uh, that we could actually bring in more talent and create more jobs. Um, and I think the 2013 figure back then, it would reduce the deficit by 158 billion over 10 years, 685 billion over the following, include the following decade. 25% uh, of our US Nobel laureates were born in other countries, 70 of our Fortune 500 companies are headed up by immigrants. Could you, uh, could you uh, tell me where you are on this? Uh Sure. You know, I, I think that as an economist, we, we talked earlier in the hearing about how if you want more output, you need more input, and, and you know, one of the inputs is labor. And so that, for sure, uh, in any economy, uh, immigration is an important part, a source of, of labor. Uh, and also, uh, you know, we have borders, so they need to be protected. I'm not an expert on border security, but I think it's also that there's bipartisan agreement that we should. Yeah, we had a bill laws. like this out of the Senate that did both things. Excuse yes. me. We had a bill that passed the Senate that had significant funding for order at the border, but also allowed this kind of legal immigration that I'm talking about. Yeah, and, and, and I'd be happy to discuss that specific okay. bill with you. And, and very good. It. But, but time I, is of the essence here. We've been waiting a decade, so. It, it, and I could add that, that I'm very grateful that my Irish ancestors came here, and I'm pretty sure they weren't allowed here because they had computer degrees. Uh, exactly. Good point. Same with mine. Came as a chef, or a chef's assistant, not a chef. Thank you. Thank you. Congressman Byer. Uh, thank you, Senator. Um, um, Mr. Chairman, uh, reports out of the recent fourth round uh, the NAFTA renegotiations uh, had not been positive, particularly regarding the reactions in Otto and in Mexico City to certain U.S. proposals. And the successful conclusion of the negotiations was, was always going to be difficult. And now we seem to be further away than, from that goal than ever before. If those renegotiations don't produce an outcome that's acceptable to the administration or to Congress, would the economy be better off if the U.S. pulled out of NAFTA or rather than the status quo? Uh, yeah, Th thank you for the question. You know, I, I am uh, not involved in the negotiations, uh, and 
you, you know, I, th I think that the president's position on trade is that our trade deals can be made better, and, and I think that, you know, as an economist, I could say that, that if an economist wrote a free trade deal, then it would be one sentence. We would say, we got free trade. Uh, if you look at the free trade deals, then they take months and months to negotiate, and they've got thousands and thousands of pages. And so I don't think that one can dispute the observation that we can make those deals better. Uh, and I think that, you know, I'm hopeful uh, to see where the negotiations lead and hope that the trade deals can be made better. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear implicit in your remarks is that you're very much a free trader. So. I'm, an, I'm an economist. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I think we can put those together. <laughs> Um, you've written in the past about the stock market, and based on public statements by senior administration, including our Treasury Secretary, who described government, quote, as a mark-to-market business. Many market participants believe that this administration views higher stock prices as a validation of its economic policies. But as you know, stock prices go up and down. What are the risks, in your view, of guiding policy based on the whims of the equity markets? Uh, you know, I don't think that there's anyone that, that I know of in the White House that's guiding policy based on what happened yesterday in the stock market. I think that our, our economic proposals are based on, on sound economic reasoning and objective analysis. I think that you're right that the market goes up and down, and the market has gone up a lot lately, and I think that there are probably, uh, if I were going to write down an economic model to predict it, a couple of reasons why. Uh, the most important would be that uh, there's an anticipated tax reform, uh, and if the corporate statutory corporate tax rate were to drop as significantly as is proposed, uh, then that would certainly have a, a positive impact on the market. Uh, and, and so exactly how big that effect is uh, and what the probability is that the market's factored in of the tax reform uh, is unclear to me. There, there's not really a, a good estimate of that, but I think that you know, one could be quite confident that if the tax reform were to fail, that that would be a big negative for the market. Okay. You know, uh, Mr. Chairman, several Fed presidents have recently noted that cutting taxes at this point in the business cycle would be highly pro-cyclical. Uh, Robert Kaplan at the Dallas Fed said, quote, my concern is you would create a bump in gross domestic product that would be short term. It would then decline back down to trend growth, except that when you decline back down, you'd be more leveraged than when you started. And San Francisco President, Fed President John Williams said, unless targeted to raise productivity and underlying potential, a tax cut could feed unsustainable growth that could ultimately be done by asset price bubbles, inflation, and possible recession. So why is now the time for added stimulus? Especially, I know you've been concerned in the past about inflation risks and fiscal risks in the past. Were those concerns unfounded in the past, or why are we being so pro-cyclical right now? That, that I would share those concerns if the tax proposal right now were a demand stimulus. Uh, but the tax proposal is to stimulate supply. And so if we stimulate supply, then there's more capital, there's higher labor productivity, uh, and you're actually making the, even the workers that are already employed more productive because they have better machines to work with. And so that doesn't create a kind of Keynesian demand inflation spiral at all, but rather uh, the increase in capital supply puts uh, downward pressure uh, or, or at, at the margin given the positive GDP growth because you're increasing supply. But we already have corporate profits are at an all-time high right now. Um, there's more capital sitting on the sidelines than there's ever been. Mm -hmm. Why do we think that changing the corporate tax structure is going to put more of that money to work? Sure. So the, the money is on the sidelines, and it's on the sidelines kind of you know, across the ocean. Uh, and, it, and the fact is that uh, the corporate money isn't turning into factories here in the U.S. because we have the highest corporate tax on earth. It's not rocket science. And if we were to reduce the corporate tax rate, then uh, companies would come back and the money would come off the sidelines because US, the U.S. again would be an attractive location for investment. We have 25 percent of those corporations pay no taxes, and the 35 percent is the statutory rate, and the actual rate is closer to 14. Wouldn't we be better off finding a way to <clears throat> get it much lower, 20, 22, 25, whatever the, the target rate is, um, by eliminating the, the preferences and the exceptions that allow 25% to pay nothing? They, they pay nothing mostly because they've located the money in Ireland or some other country offshore, and so therefore it avoids the U.S. tax. And so that's precisely the link that we're trying, the offshoring model that we're trying to sever with this proposal. Great, great. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank I yield back. Thank you. Um, Mr. Hassett, I wanted to ask you, generally speaking, 
what you believe the bright spots are in our economy. We, we talk a lot, understandably, and with good necessity about some of the things that scare us, that worry us. Uh, but I'm curious to know, uh, as an economist, not only what you think are the bright spots, but also what, what has surprised you uh, about our economy over the last few years. Sure, I, I think that there are a number of bright spots, and we're really starting to see it in the data, that uh, with GDP growth going up north of 3%, we'll get another release this week. It'll probably be hurricane affected, but be a little bit below 2% would be my guess. But uh, the expectation of the professional staff at the CEA is that we're currently looking at a second half of the year that on average will be north of 3% of growth. So that would be you know, on average three quarters in a row. And I think that going from the sort of new normal of 1.9 to 3%, that that bright spot, which is really a nice headline for, for America's workers, uh, is mostly attributable to a surge in capital formation that I think is there because of increased optimism about deregulation and lower taxes. And so I think that right now it's incumbent on us to see that bright spot and to make sure that it stays bright uh, by, by delivering on the, expect, you know, the, the policies that we promised, but, but especially on taxes haven't been delivered yet. But I think that firms are optimistic because they expect that we're going to succeed. Thank you. Uh, uh, that's, that's good insight. Um, as, as you're aware, some of the tax reform proposals that we've been looking at uh, have included a discussion of a separate rate for pass-through entities. The idea is that there would be separate rules that would go along with the separate uh, pass-through rate uh, that would be there to um, thwart opportunistic manipulative tax avoidance. What, in your opinion, uh, would those rules look like and, and how would this work? Yeah, I, it, the, we. It, absolutely believe that the uh, corporate rate reduction uh, to 20 percent requires some kind of commensurate uh, rate reduction for pass-through businesses, America's small businesses, but also recognize that the guardrails around that 25 percent rate need to be very good because otherwise, you know, I guess, you know, LeBron James is going to be getting the 25 percent because he's a small business and, you know, I love him, maybe the greatest basketball player of all time, but I think he should pay you know, the top marginal tax rate because it's labor income. Uh, you see how hard he works on the court. And, and, and so I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I, the, the, I've, I hear the lawyers talk about the guardrail things, and, and I know that there's a lot of optimism that this can be constructed in a, in a prudent way, uh, but I, I have to wait and see what the final outcome is before I can do an economic analysis of it. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, Representative Kompsa. Thank you. You know, I think this morning we did hear a lot of the Kind of same critiques uh, that we've heard in the past from 1980s, you know, really for the past 30 years, trickled, you know, the, you know, all the disparaging remarks that you heard today. But we're really in a different economy now, this information economy and the international economy that we have. And as, as you've pointed out numerous times, you know, if people can leave and find, go to Ireland and find a a talent pool there that allows them, you know, Microsoft or a lot of our tech companies to go there. That's what we're competing with. So what kind of new thinking that maybe gets past some of the same partisan language that you've, that, you know, has kind of been renewed after, I, I, I thought we had all sort of agreed our corporate rate was too high, but now we're kind of revert, you know, you're, we're seeing that reversion um, on the partisan front to the same old tired critiques. What kind of uh, new thinking can we do with this new economy so that we can get past some of those partisan divides and if you could just uh, kind of following up on some of the bright spots, but also you know, that we can't really thrive and have three, four percent growth if we stick with those old models? You know, I think that there's so much that the members of this committee agree about, uh, the fact that there's a disconnect between profits and wages. The fact that we've got the highest uh, statutory rate on earth, but there's a whole bunch of companies that don't pay it. The fact that wage growth has been completely unacceptable and that it's really the responsibility of the members of Congress to think about why those patterns exist in the data and then to come up with something that we're going to do about it. And uh, I understand that partisanship is, you know, part, part of, you know, what we do it's in, here in Washington. It's, it's inevitable. Uh, but I've not seen an alternative theory for this set of facts that is in any way uh, moving for me. And, and I just honestly hope that uh, 
that the responsibility that we all have for America's workers, for the people that are working harder every day and not getting more money, uh, can, can help us work together on this bipartisan t tax reform. Uh, I think it's designed to be the same kind of process we had in 86, where a great tax reform passed that was a big positive uh, for the economy. And, and I'm still hopeful that that can uh, be achieved if people will start to focus on the, the actual analysis. Like so, so why have wages been growing so slowly even though profits have not? What's your story for that if it's not the one that we're talking about? I don't think that there's a good alternative. And, and Larry Lindsay had an article where he was talking about the difference between the 3.1 or 3.2 percent growth and the 2.1 that we've had from 2011 to 16, that average of 2.1. What is, the, what is that the difference between a 2.1 and a 3.1 to the economy and to, you know, long-term things like Social Security and sure. our entitlements? Yeah, you know, the, the, these are going to be slightly incorrect, but they're useful rules of thumb because they're round numbers and they're easy to remember. If we get an extra percent of GDP growth, then that's about a million jobs. Uh, that's about $1,000 per household. Uh, and so if we can come up with a tax plan that adds, you know, pick your favorite number, three, three or four percent over 10 years, uh, then you multiply those out. It's a lot of money. It's a lot of jobs. Uh, and uh, yeah, so that's how I think about it. And then as we were talking earlier, if we also have that skill upgrades, you're really talking about wage growth of a lot more than a thousand. If you go from being somebody who maybe loses your uh, coal job, although those are very high income and you know you can get like 80 90 hundred thousand dollars in coal country but if, but if you move into some of these technology jobs engineering construction a lot of these things that ha also have very high pay um, we, we need to be um, supporting and you know through the tax structures through the business process supporting that relocation and that re uh, assignment uh, of of jobs and, and and labor too also so that would You'd be talking about a lot more than a thousand dollars increase when you, when you get them into that higher information economy, right? Sure, you're exactly right. It's something that we talked a lot about in the White House. The president even tweeted about uh, people needing to move if they're having a hard time finding a job to the pl the, the labor markets that are hot. Yeah, great. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Really appreciate the opportunity to visit this morning. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hassett, we thank you for coming, and um, thank you for having me. your insight today has been very helpful. We are grateful also uh, for the service you provide to the country and the administration. Should members uh, wish to submit uh, questions for the record, the hearing uh, record will remain open for five business days, and with that, we'll be adjourned. Thank you.